Hi there, this is Debbie Nicholson. I'm the Director of Community Outreach and I'm coming to you this morning with a former board member. Her name is Andrea Anderson and she came to be cancer after her cancer diagnosis and she wanted to get involved and she wanted to help and she wanted to just feel connected to support and now she really wants to tell her story. She feels that there's a great message that she has that a lot of people can derive a lot of hope and healing and support from. And she's, she has great presentation and she's raw and honest and she's the real deal and you're gonna love her. So welcome, Andrea. Thank you. And actually you almost made me cry. So let me get my tissue box. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you for having me. And um, as Deborah said, I'm very thankful um, actually to be in this moment right now and to be able to uh, share because obviously been there, done that. And it's um, as many people who are in it, um, you know, you have very wavering emotions from minute to minute. And even as I was diagnosed on May 5th, 2015, and here I am almost what, four years out, I'm, I, I'm, I still feel like I'm as raw um, on the spectrum of emotions, um, because there's a lot of disbelief um, in terms of, you know, being diagnosed and then everything you go through. Um, and one can feel like it's, and I literally call it PTSD, because you've gone to war, you've come back scarred with, you know, limbs removed, and then you're supposed to just assimilate back into normal life. Well, the re the, one of the reasons why I want to be here today, and, and Deborah and I have talked about this over the last you know, few months around what would be the best way to kind of unpack this that would be meaningful for those who are in it right now and who are looking for you know, somebody else, you know, learnings, lessons, you know, whatever that could be valuable to you. And so I want to just take time to kind of unpack it because it's deep, you know, it's deep for each one of us. And at the same time, it's therapeutic, as we all know, to kind of tell our story. So um, anyway, uh, today, Deborah and I were just kind of thinking, let's talk about the first 24 hours, you know, the day of diagnosis, because for most of us, you know, you're leading a life up into that moment in ignorant bliss. You may be going about your business thinking you're healthy, life's good, and then, wow, you know, in that pivotal moment, everything changes. So um, if I may, I'm just going to give a couple, you know, tidbits about myself and then um, leading up to kind of what brought me to my knees, obviously, on that fateful day. Um, so... I was diagnosed at age 42 and leading up to, you know, my twenties and thirties, I was, a, I was one of those, uh, type A, still am a type A, but type A who was hardcore in my career, you know, um, I was intense. I was all about, you know, the adrenaline, the winning, um, probably didn't have the best sleep patterns. You know, I, I, in hindsight, I didn't eat well. I was, I was a Starbucks vanilla ice vanilla latte junkie and I probably had like three a day and I was just pumping it out, you know, just, ah. and, but I always thought I was relatively healthy because I was a runner and um, I was an athlete. So I'd been like actively running and lifting weights. Anyway, long story short, That's a very <laughs> similar thing that I hear. Um, yeah, People were at the top of their career and they were really right. doing great. Sometimes a single mother, they were runners. They were, yeah. I hear this a lot. Yeah, it's nuts. Um, and, you know, and I was like getting mammograms, um, which on a separate note will lead into kind of why there's even more shock. But um, also important to note is because I'd had mammograms in my 30s, three to be exact, and never found anything. Um, Why did you have them so early? What's that? Why did you have them in your 30s? Yeah, I had it because we had family history. Okay. And my mom actually had been diagnosed at age 39. Uh, but, she, but I never equated it as genetics because she had a very unhealthy left lifestyle. She was a drinker. She was a heavy smoker and she didn't work out. So I'm thinking, oh, okay, well that uh, might make sense. That might make sense why she would get cancer, breast cancer. And she, my mom had been diagnosed um, three times. She'd gotten cancer three times 
and then ultimately um, got bone cancer stage four and actually just passed away two and a half years ago while I just came out of my cancer diagnosis and treatments. But that is why I was getting mammograms um, was because of family history. So I'd had three in my 30s, nothing detected and no mention of dense breasts, that that was, you know, mammograms don't work with dense breasts. Um, and plus, you know, I have people poking and prodding as you get your, your breast exams too. So nothing was ever Some People are pretty dense before 40, aren't they? Yeah. It's just and interesting it's because uh, my grandmother and four of her sisters had breast <laughs> cancer and I pushed my doctor to let me get one before 40 and he didn't want to do it. He really fought me. Right. And looking back, I should have listened, but um, that's just yeah. interesting. Yeah, it's nuts, you know. Um, so I'm kind of going down this path of why would I ever think I have breast cancer, especially because I'm a relatively, I had like a size A, B breast anyway. So I'm thinking, you know, where would a tumor be anyway? Right. Um, so anyway, I was also, uh, as part of my type A personality, you know, I always wanted a family. So I thought by age 38, I was like, I want to have kids. So I started doing an IVF process. So hadn't even met the guy yet, but let me go ahead and put some, I eggs on ice. So I'm in starting to inject myself with hormones as you, as many women probably are familiar with, that's part of the cycle. Um, didn't I, I'm, and then again, hindsight, I know that the doctors tell you that there's a chance of breast cancer, but you don't, why would I think again, that that's a risk? Cause I've already been tested three times. Okay. So at age 38, 40, I started the first round, like, let me, let me pump some hormones and let's just get some harvest, harvested eggs. And why, I, why I'm sharing that too, is because for the next two and a half years, um, I'm doing IVF cycles, which is loading my body up with hormones as well. And, um, that's interesting to note because my cancer type was, of course, hormone positive, HER2 negative. So I was estrogen, progesterone positive, HER2 negative. Um, so again, one will never know, you know, was it just a, a misdiagnosis or did the hormones put the gas on the fire? Yeah, I'm sure probably all of the above. But um, yeah, so meanwhile, I did meet my husband. And we ended up moving forward with this IVF process so that, you know, I, I being a little bit older than my husband was like, okay, running out of time, tick tock, tick tock. So let's make sure we can have a child before I get too old. Well, the fourth IVF transfer was the one that is now our son. So I was in a blissful mommy, you know, pregnancy, very healthy. I was still running. I was still lifting weights. I was just, just uh, beyond happy, obviously. I'm going to have a baby. Um, I'm turning 42 soon, you know, and everything was great. And then I was going in for my week 30 di uh, checkup with my OBGYN and it was literally May 5th, 2015, you know, Cinco de Mayo. And the weird thing that led up to that day too is for the, I had been noticing this dent in my breast anyway. And I was like, oh, that's kind of weird, you know, just random divot, kind of like a smooth and then in a little bit, but like almost like a fold. And I touched it, of course, and it was a big lump. And I thought, oh, it must be a milk gland. You know, why would it, I'm pregnant, so that makes sense. It's milk gland. So I never mentioned anything for like a couple months. I, no, I had noticed it, and I just had like, oh, look at that, a milk gland. How cool, part of the pregnancy. And, uh, but this May 5th, I mean, right, it's just, um, this is why things are, I truly believe everything happens for a reason, because that day, just to give you guys a little bit of interesting to know, I almost didn't get my doctor's appointment because of scheduling issues at the office. Uh, we waited an hour for me to go see my doctor on my scheduled checkup. My husband had to leave to go back to work, so I'm by myself, and I go in to see my doctor, and, and the checkup's fine, you know, see my baby on the screen and all that, and then at the end, I was like, I felt like this whisper in my ear, and I, again, in hindsight, you know, I'm being a Christian and all, I know that that was probably God whispering to me, say something, and nudging me, um, and thank God. Um, so... 
So I said something to her. I was like, oh, by the way, by the way, I have this, I have this lump here. And she being a very stoic Asian woman, like freaks out, like literally, I never saw any emotion in her. She turns and she's like, what? You know, and she immediately comes over and pushes and, you know, pokes and prods. And then she does an ultrasound wand. And then she's like, yeah, you need to get up to see uh, Dr. Christy Funk up in the Beverly Hills area today. And then I was like, what are you saying? You know, what, what the hell? And she's like, this is serious. And I'm like, immediately crash, crash. I'm first of all, you're sitting by yourself. My first child, I've waited my whole life to have a child. Are you freaking kidding me right now? So I leave there in obviously shock. I'm week 30 pregnant. I call my husband and I said, you know, I'm like, we have to go up to Dr. Christy Funk for an ultrasound at the Pink Lotus Breast Center at three. And obviously you need to come with me. So we meet up there. I can't remember even if he drove me up, came and got me. Yeah, I'm sure he came and drove me. I don't even remember. We get there, we wait for an hour and 45 minutes to be squeezed in. And I remember thinking, you know, I'm looking in the waiting room and there are a bunch of people with, you know, bald heads and, you know, and I'm thinking, here I am pregnant. I felt like a freak. I felt like a complete freak and thinking, how is this happening? And we finally got in, you know, and I'll, and again, I'll never forget, uh, even though, again, it was almost four years ago, laying on the table and... Um, having to sit there with the doctor and my husband holding my hand. And I remember like, you know how you, you're told to be present, especially on beautiful days, you know, your wedding day, you know, don't, don't let the moments pass you by, be present, be present. And I remember laying there thinking, my God, my life has been a constant shit show. Pardon my language folks, but has been a constant battle and it's not been easy street. And I'm laying there, I'm like, really God? This is, this is how it's going to go down. Like, I'm going to be diagnosed with cancer. Like, what? You know? And I look up, and I see the, the lady's, you know, Dr. Funk's face, and she's pressing into my boob, and she's looking under my armpit for the lymph nodes, and she said, yeah, I'm con this is concerning. Uh, you, you have cancer. And in that moment, I felt like my split second thinking, I'm, I'm going to be, I'm going to die. I'm dying. Like, this is it. You are kidding me right now. Because my mom had already been diagnosed with stage four a year earlier. And I'm thinking, I'm following my mom's footsteps to a T. And I'm thinking, oh, wow. Like, this is how it's going to go out. This is how it's going to go down. I'm going to die. Are you kidding? And, and I, yeah, it's just, it was horrific. Um, I know it's even hard to put into words. And anyone that's been diagnosed, I know you know what I'm saying. It's that out of body experience, like in that moment, this is it. I'm dying. This is how it goes out. And um, my husband and I holding hands, and I'm like, WTF? And so immediately they whisk me to do a, in that same room, they prepare me immediately for a biopsy. And I think they do that deliberately just because they don't want you to digest it. They just want to keep it moving because let's face it, biopsies hurt. And so. And they won't really diagnose you without one. No, they don't. And it was like, okay. So they team me up for the for the lymph node one, um, my husband's asked to leave the room because what they probably already knew is that I would be in excruciating pain. And so he leaves and goes to the lobby and then I'm sitting there, they're getting me ready for the lymph node and uh, by all means, it was the most painful thing in my entire life. I'm, they put the needle in and apparently the, it was, my lymph was wrapped, the tumor was wrapped around a nerve. And guys, I have, I don't know, I screamed every curdling F-bomb known to man. My husband heard me out in the lobby because it was like the worst experience and they had to bring it out, put it back in. And it was just like, I, I don't even know, my poor son in, in the womb, you know, I'm crying. <clears throat> and then they do the breast, you know, and that one was like, you know, cakewalk compared to the lymph node. And then 
or basically a patient coordinator comes in and tries to give you some hope and you know what have you and support and it, again at that point I'm just like I just you know seriously I don't even want to digest what's happening and in a weird sense when you are diagnosed too it's like and I, again I don't think this by accident you you're flooded something spiritual or something with the serotonin something's weird where it starts flooding your body with this spiritual hope or something I don't know what it is but I've never experienced it except for that time you know of like immediately in the cancer zone you're flooded with the most horrific feeling but at the same time there's an, a weird spiritual um positive thing that flood starts to flood you i don't know it's hope you know and it's probably the holy spirit or whoever you know your higher power is but it's immediately starts attaching to you and it flips your mind to be like okay every, you feel immense love from everybody and it's like you're an open chamber of love and you walk out you know we kind of walk out and we're like okay we'll give you the results tomorrow morning and my husband and I just walk out of there like, you know, uh, obviously in shock and crying and disbelief. And, and I don't even remember the drive home. I don't even, even to this day, I asked him, I said, I don't even, did you drive me home? Did I drive? What, how the hell did we get home? Because the shock had immediately taken over. Um, and, and, and the anger, quite frankly, the anger, the, uh, all right, God, you kidding me right now? I'm pregnant. I've, I've had a shitty childhood. I had a shitty upbringing. <laughs> this is how it goes down, you know? And it's like the unfairness of, of it all, thinking that, you know, um, yeah, you just, how did I get here? And, and I'm, I'm going to die, you know, like, and what does that mean for my unborn child? Um, and yeah, so that was like the, the, the moment of diagnosis. And then obviously waking up for the results um, and getting the phone call with the confirmation of what type it was. And that um, for all of us that get diagnosed, you know, of course you go nutso with the Google searches and the death statistics and like, you know, everything is death, death, death. And, and it's so serious and you know what's serious, but you can't stop yourself, you know? And so we get the, even when we get the phone call um, from the doctor and I even, it's so funny, I even saved my notes from the day of the call, writing down what sense of it, you know, so I could immediately go online and start researching. And uh, the, the doctor telling us it is cancer and it's stage 2B, stage three um, and some, you know, estimates around the size, um, the Bloom Richardson scale, which is, I think I was like on three, you know, like the most aggressive type. So she was even in hindsight then trying to spin it. Well, it's, it's aggressive and it's kind of, you know, that's where we want the cancer to be so that, you know, we have a better chance of treating it. And I thought to myself, oh, okay. So again, trying to do a positive spin that the treatments will work the more aggressive your cancer type. And I thought, well, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Like, that shouldn't be good news, you know? Um, but again, trying to, you know, they're doing their best too, to their defense to like give you some hope. But like, you know, here you are already by default flooding your body with hormones because you're pregnant. Your cancer type is hormone positive. And yet also given the profile of your cancer type, oh, it's aggressive and we need to start treatment immediately immediately and I'm, i remember looking at my husband going what chemo are you kidding you're said wait wait a minute time out you're suggesting chemo and i'm pregnant right. but told me i can't have wine but i can flood right. my body with chemo and i thought that to be the most hypocritical thing i've ever heard in my freaking life right. it, but it's safe chemo's safe for the when you're pregnant safe chemo and i thought i already knew that doesn't even make sense but in that moment, you're, again, anyone that has been diagnosed, you know, you have that fork in the road now, like, okay, I don't even know enough at all. This is like completely life changing, as you already know. I have no idea what I should do. I've got some of my friends already hitting me up with, you know, you gotta do natural, 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 natural. 
do this, do this, do this, do this. And I, immediately like that, I had everybody telling me their advice. Right. It was so overwhelming. So yeah, so, so I was in a, in a series of, of everybody having an opinion on what I should do. Don't do this, don't do that. Because it was so interesting how I had, you know, two groups of, of opinion. I had the, the group of folks that were, you know, do it naturally, alternative, and which at the time I even thought, you know, quackery, like, shut up, you know, like, stop. And then the other side, of course, with the conventional treatments, you know, that that was the way to go. And it was so overwhelming to the point where, because meanwhile, I'm also doing my own Google search, um, you know, what I should do, et cetera. And it was around the same time when the truth about cancer was just released for the first time. And one of my quackery friends who'd been in the space of holistic living for five years, she sent that to me. And I watched, my husband and I watched it that very night. It was Friday, May 6th. And of course, as any of you who, who have watched it know, episode one was about chemotherapy in the pharmaceutical industry and how it's basically a big sham. <laughs> and I'm sitting there, both of us, not necessarily like we were conspiracy theorists, but, you know, I have pretty conservative views and enough to know like, okay, yeah, there's capitalism and people out there trying to make money. But it wasn't until that episode where I really was like hit square in the, in the forehead, like, holy crap, you know, like, no, no, this can't be happening. And so I had to basically you know, make the call within five days of will I accept my chemotherapy appointment? And at that point, you know how, again, you're like, I don't have enough information. I don't know when someone tells me it's aggressive and serious, you know, and I'm being, as everybody knows, you're being um, pushed immediately into chemo. Like you just got diagnosed next day, you're in a chemo appointment. I mean, it's that insanity. There's, they don't even give you time to think. They don't even, you don't even think you have the right to refuse it. Let's just put it that way. You're, you're just going down the conveyor belt at that point. And meanwhile, you know, I'm, I'm of course reflecting on, you know, my life choices and, you know, where did I go wrong? Why? Yeah. Could it, it, yeah. And it's like, could, could it be true that my, you know, my lifestyle choices, my, my stress, I knew my stress was never good for me. You know, my caffeine, the sugar, the food, could that all really have been something that prevented the disease to begin with? And I, and I wasn't refusing that as like, oh, that's just silly talk. Because of course we all know we're, you know, our bodies are truly, um, you know, a marvel of medicine really. And, um, so it was just in that split moment, like, wow, okay. So I'm, I'm getting pushed down the conveyor belt into chemo and I'm pregnant. And I'm like, this, everything about that. So right. I'm curious, were you told any dangers to the baby or? No. Nothing. No. What was, what was sold to me and was, you know, there's a point, let's say 0.5% chance that your child could have chemo, uh, leukemia later in life. So like the risks to the child was only 0.5% with this chemo, pregnancy approved chemo, which was ACH at the time. Um, no chance of losing the baby, no other, uh, nothing. No. And it's perfectly safe because somehow the the placenta protects the baby from the toxicity of the chemo. <laughs> and I'm thinking, both of us are like, how could that be, you know? Um, so, you know, you, you, you yeah, know, mind boggling. You know, it's insane. You know, it's insane. But what, what are the alternatives? Die, die. We both die. I mean, like you, you don't even, you can't even comprehend it. 
you know, so you just, so I'm going down that path of, okay, I'm entering the conventional treatments, but I, but everything in my being is telling me this, this cannot be right. This cannot be right. But I'm going down, I'm going through the motions because I don't have enough in the basically 36 hours to make the right decision because you're literally shuttled off. Right. Got to go, 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 go. And it's, you don't feel like you have the ability, first of all, the ability to say, wait, let me think, let me think, let me get like some information that's a little bit more broad than just this is it and that that was the piece and again i know i'll go into this in more details um, throughout some of these podcasts but in that moment you know you're so naive you don't know and you don't know what you don't know and so you can only really do what you've seen you know 99 percent of the population do which is you move this is the your rite of passage now is chemo mastectomy and radiation and you go down that path, mm-hmm. all knowing that this doesn't even make any logical sense. But what are my alternatives? Especially now that I'm with child. Right. So, yeah, it's, it's insanity, really. So Complete what insanity. What do you do? Um, well, I, I continued as I'm going through the motion, and I remember the first chemo appointment was, um, I think literally a week later, I started on Thursday. So literally one week later after diagnosis. And um, in parallel, you know, the, the amateur hour of research is like relentless at home, my husband and I, with everything on Google and continuing to watch the Truth About Cancer docuseries. Every night we were watching that, and there was nine episodes. Mm-hmm. And one of the episodes, um, you know, with Dr. Beta and Dr. Keneally down in Irvine, Center for New Medicine. And I was like, oh, wait, they're in Irvine, you know? And then I, in parallel, set up an appointment to, to, to see Dr., the, whoever I could see as soon as possible, which turned out to be Dr. Beta. And, um, that's where it kind of started it was like, basically, I think my first visit with them. So I started, you know, my conventional treatments in May. And then I believe I started seeing Dr. Bita, um, I want to say after I gave birth. So it would have been like July or August. Um, because even up to that point, it was way too, it was so overwhelming that I could not process all of the noise that was coming at me with information overload. So. And how are you feeling? Uh, here's the weird thing. Um, you, the day, the first time of chemo, uh, you have this, literally, you're like a warrior preparing for battle. That's the way I felt. I felt like, so you're not gonna get me, man. And I remember like, you know, you walk in there you kind of feel like a freak because I, again, I was pregnant. And so everybody's like, Oh my God, what are you doing? You know, you're pregnant. Don't, you know, it's almost like the judgment of what are you doing? You should know you're killing your baby, you know? So there was like that little bit of shame, but at the same time, you know, it was just, um, I don't even know. I can't even put it into words. It was just, it was horrific. And, and, you know, they give you the, the information and you sit down and they get, get you ready for the IV, which, uh, hurt like a, you know what? Cause I, I, I didn't do a port. And so I was like, every time going eight, eight rounds of chemo, I was getting, you know, stuck with needle with the IV, which again, anyone that knows, um, the process, uh, your veins get more and more sensitive um, your body is more and more sensitive because of all the toxins and it, it's, it's excruciating pain when you get the IV put in for the chemo. Um, so, you know, you sit down and they saddle you up for the big IV and put, putting it in your arm. And I remember I was so emotional. I was crying, you know, my husband's there and I'm just like, but then at the same time, as I mentioned earlier, you have this weird chemistry of serotonin's because your inherent fight or flight, you know how that moment in time where you're like, you're not going to get me. And so your body already goes into warrior mode. 
of like, I'm bigger than this. I'm, I'm, you're not going to, this isn't going to stop me. So you're immediately into that weird, um, space of, uh, positivity. It's weird. And I have not experienced it. I've always been a very strong person, you know, but in that experience of fighting cancer, your body elevates to a whole other level. Uh, is the only way I can explain it. Um, uh, positivity that you didn't even know you had. Um, at the pits of despair comes this feeling of higher power. It's and interesting because the mind, body, spirit connection, I guess, all comes into play. It's like survival and it's not by accident. It's like God or that Holy Spirit attaches to you in that moment and you're in a Zen place and you're in immense pain and your tears, and then, you know, you're, no, you're looking at the drip, and you're thinking, oh, my God, like, you know, they're already suited up. The, the nurses administering the, the chemicals are suited up, and it's everything, skulls and crossbones and red warning on the package, and now that's in my arm. That's now floating in my arm. Like, they're in a haz hazard mask, gloves and suited up, and, but it's safe for my baby. That's how much BS this is. And actually, as I'm telling you, it pisses me off even as I'm sitting here, the, the sham and the whole thing. Oh, yeah, that's just terrible. And then you're sitting there um, and, you know, you're getting your drip and, and I'm watching my belly, my kid move around, you know. Um, it's insane. It's insane. And that's, and that's the... One, were you questioning yourself, like... Am I doing yes. that thing? Should I be here? Yes, I was. I was horrified. I was horrified. side effects after. I had um, oddly not yet. Um, it wasn't until probably the second round where I started to feel the neuro. I had severe neuropathy, um, and the four round. Basically, they gave me four rounds of ACH because that was supposed to be the while I was pregnant, I was basically going to have chemo every other week um, and then stop to give birth and then resume chemo two weeks after that. <laughs> and I remember like, okay, so I got to basically three rounds of ACH while pregnant and I told the doctors I'm not doing fourth because to your point, like I started like my, my baby was bouncing, Panos, my son was bouncing around in my belly during chemo. And I'm like, this is BS. And so I said, I'm not doing a fourth, not doing it. And they're like, and that's when I realized when I actually pushed back to say, okay, I'm not doing, not only am I not doing the fourth, I am starting to get neuropathy where I can't feel my hands and my feet. So I need, you need to do something. You need to reduce the dosage or something, which they did. So then I realized, okay, wait, I can actually have an opinion mm. about what I am to receive. And that was like the first glimpse of like, okay, because now as, as any of us know, when you're doing all that research and you start becoming, you know, amateur doctor or whatever, and you're starting to challenge even your oncologist with questions that they can't answer. Um, and so I realized like, okay, neuropathy, dial it down a little bit. You're giving me too much. You don't need to blast my head off with chemicals because there's, as, as we now know, alternative treatment centers like Center for New Medicine they use a very low dose chemo sometimes. And that's, that's effective with a vitamin C 50 gram IV. So why are we getting maxed out, blown, your head blown off with chemo where your body, your limbs are neuropathy, you know, experiencing neuropathy, no more nerve. You have so much nerve damage from the chemicals. That is the objective, I guess, you know, and, um, I feel whatever. like they just throw everything at the wall to see what totally. sits. Like they don't oh. even know if it's exactly what you need for your specific no. DNA mutations. They just not at all. everything at it, see what sticks and whatever happens. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And you know, and again, that's what you touch on a great point because again, while I'm in parallel doing the, the conventional in parallel doing Dr. Beta. So, um, I don't know what it was or how it came to be, but anyway, I started getting my, at Dr. Beta or the Center for New Medicine, I started seeing all, all the, the tests that they do and I was really immersed. And I know we'll get into this in some uh, subsequent uh, podcasts, but really immersed in understanding, again, yeah, the holistic system and what kind of blood work I should be getting done 
to start looking at strength of the immune, liver functionality, you know, um, methylation, toxicity, and then also just tracking circulating tumor cells. So, um, and also getting the profile of the cancer type and what natural agents will actually work to kill your cancer. Right. And what chemos would be most effective for your cancer type, which is called the chemosensitivity test. Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, some conventional doctors actually could offer that to you, but people, they don't, because to your point, they might have another objective is from a pharmaceutical standpoint of pushing and promoting a chemo drug. I mean, so. Don't they get kicked? I mean, they profit. They though. get rebates. Right. Yeah, they get. That's part of their salary. Yeah, they get the financial incentive from the pharmaceutical that's company, which we all conflict of interest. Totally. Right. So yeah, so the chemo thing, you know, and again, and, and I, I, I don't even know. I'm not suggesting that one, you know, must be or the other. All I'm saying is that, like, you know, based on where you are in your own moment of time, you know, obviously you have to make the choice that's best for you that you can feel comfortable with and live with. But um, what I would have loved to be able to do differently is be able to have more of a voice with more, because I didn't have enough information that I felt I could be empowered to challenge or question because, you know, in that moment, again, you're inundated and you're trying to assimilate data as fast as possible. And for a lot of us, it's so overwhelming you shut down and you numb out and you just go through the motion. And I guess I would say, because I've been there, done that, you know, um, trying to silence around you, try to be centered, and then just try to do what you can in chunks of information that you can digest and give yourself a moment to breathe and to process and then decide what's best for you. Instead of feeling like you must make a decision tomorrow because were you told that you had to make you, that you had yes. to do something fast? Yes, I was diagnosed, and then I was pushed so heavily. And this is again in hindsight, it's disgusting. The it felt like when I had my appointment with the oncologist, they were pushing me hard. You got to get in right away, right away. We got to get you in right away, right away, right. It's like within two days, I'm starting my drip. I mean, that's how nuts it was, and that still makes me really not. It's, I'm, I'm angry, but I'm annoyed. Like, what, what's going to happen in three days? Am I going right, to die? Because like, huh. you just found out, but it really, it's been there for a very long time. Right. It takes three to eight years to grow. What's a week? Let me get my bearings. You know, like, it's like, you know, slow your roll, people. And so, um, you know, again, in hindsight. Like, if you're in fear, how do you really think? You don't. You, you, you have to, I guess, learn to settle that first. Exactly. You, you can, exactly. Right. Like that must let me, be a really tough thing to do. Right. And and that's a very good point because you know, everybody knows when you're faced with something, no matter to what degree of crisis you're in, whether it is health or financial, whatever, it's like what do you need to do? You need to retreat, process and then plan your next steps. And in the moment of diagnosis, the way things are, you're literally pushed. They push and they do push you. Well, it, you know, it, I'm wondering if some of that's kind of a protective thing that your body does. I mean, it, it might be, it, it might feel better to just pass it off to somebody else because you're actually like protecting yourself from the shock. That's a really good point, actually, because in a lot of ways, I'm sure you know, I want to try to see the best in people. So the, the, to the point that you're making, it's like, well, maybe to their defense, it's about, look, we know you're in shock and we don't want that person to go into some, you know, hiding or hiding or denial, you know, so they, they push you because they want you to take an action to get some sort of help. Now, if you decide what path is right for you, the point is, and some action is needed, you know, but I, I still think that as an individual, you know, a little bit of a better approach would be, look, we want to give you an opportunity to digest it, to process and come back with questions. Ideally, we'd like you to, you know, have a, have an action plan in place, ready to start going forward within the next three to four weeks. Now that seems a little softer 
than like, you're, you're this, you're that, you're, you got to get in. It's like this pan and that creates the frenzy for the patient. And you feel like you have no other mechanism for treatment than the and one. Nobody offered you anything as far as stress no. relief or no. any lifestyle, like any no. um, diet information or oh, no. You know, no. we want you hear something that may be of comfort. Big fat zero. In fact, even to this day, because I have two dueling opinions of treatment, I still see Dr. Beta and I still see my oncologist mm -hmm. and I will deliberately push buttons with the oncologist. Well, I think blah, 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 blah. And she was like, well, there's not enough testing, blah, blah. I said, no, there doesn't need to be testing because it just makes good scientific sense. And then, and or I'll tell her, you know, tell me exactly how tamoxifen is supposed to improve my estrogen levels. Right. And I said, aren't there natural ways to do that? No, no clue. And I said, because it seems to me, because everything is hormonally imbalanced, if I could just balance my hormones and get my dominance under control by removing xenoestrogens and about, you know, eating more greens, being out, whatever, and detoxing that that would help drive those down. No, no, and quite frankly, I said, you show me what blood work test you can do that shows the tamoxifen's working. She can't. And so when she couldn't tell me, I said, I'm stopping taking them. So I stopped my tamoxifen, for example, because for me, I felt like there's many natural ways, for example, to balance your estrogen. And I don't think they ever tell you like what you can expect as the outcome from tamoxifen versus mm -hmm. what the side effects are going to be. Oh, so they you can make the side effects. Decision. But they do. And that's the thing. Even again, they do. So, okay, well, here's the, here's again, the, the little protocol for treatment. You're done with the radio. Well, I, I don't know. I think when I finished chemo, I went right into tamoxifen and I did not want to take it either. Again, it's like you're, everything you read in the, you know, the book they give you about the tamoxifen and all the side effects, it's like death, death hot flashes, secondary cancers. And I'm thinking to myself, how is this acceptable treatment? Because the whole thing, you're, you're selling me on, if I take this magical pill, it cuts my chance of recurrence by, I can't even remember what they were flashing up at 50% or something. And I'm thinking, but all the side effects and the cause of the secondary cancer, but this is my magical. So all I have to do to not get Lots cancer. years though. BS. It cuts take 50 percent in how many years? They want you to take it at least five years, and it ch cuts your rate of recurrence, let's say, by fifty percent. In within five years. Within five years. But after that, or and now, quite frankly, the the protocol is they wanted me to take it ten years, and I literally was so annoyed with that. I said, I was like, screw that! I am not taking this pill for ten years like i was i'm actually pissed off about it like that's horrific like come on and so i said if you can't tell me again there's no magical pill there's no magic pill and then you don't have to do anything to take responsibility for your health so sorry this doesn't make sense and so to your point like this is not the answer what else can i be doing to balance my mind my body and my spirit because it's all interconnected and there's no support you get from the traditional oncologist that I'm seeing, which, oh, by the way, and I am gonna say this, is part of the Cedar sinai uh, medical system, which is one of the leading centers for cancer. And there's no counseling offered. And again, in hindsight, they do give you some references for support groups and things, definitely, but there's not a strong belief that nutrition is an acceptable path for prevention. They don't believe that and they will not tout it at all. No matter how much you challenge them, they'll never say that. Well, they're not taught it. So. Exactly, and they, they, they won't um, because we, we, you know, what, we can all assume we know why, but yeah, so that, that's kind of like, you know, in the nutshell, like, all right, here it is, you know, the first 24 hours and immediately carted off and pressured into the next path, which is, you know, chemo. And had I not seen, you know, to the, to the defense of my one quackery friend at the time who forwarded me the truth about cancer, I don't even know, you know, where I would have started.
quite frankly, on just getting access to information. And the same thing with beatcancer.org. It's like trying to refer people to something that opens their eyes, first of all, because you know it, I know it. Unfortunately, people don't, aren't forced to see a different way until they get sick a lot of times or a family member gets sick. Right. So you don't know what you don't know until it's too late. Right. So um, being able to give people a tool and a, a channel to get some information in a condensed, consolidated way is priceless when you're in the moment of the fire. Yeah, and to me, there's just, um, when, when all these things come up that don't make sense, it mm -hmm. kind of punches holes in things. So now credibility's question because your gut is telling you something's not making sense. Exactly. They don't really have the answers. So then you, you would normally go seek other avenues because things aren't making sense. And I exactly. think that's why people are starting to seek other avenues now. That's right. Yeah. Or they've gone through conventional treatment and then it has failed and made them feel worse mm -hmm. or all of the above. So, right. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's why even, even to this day, you know, even, even when I was diagnosed, I remember all my friends and family too, because immediately, immediately having to pivot from, okay, I know now from, let's say a more holistic approach, I was started focusing on nutrition and again, it was extremely overwhelming. Um, but you know, immediately having even friends and family starting to say, you know, I started even here's what I'm learning and started sharing out immediately because I was horrified. Like, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Why isn't this shared with anybody? Like this is below me. Right. And so immediately started being that person, um, that people were starting to ask because, everybody else was shocked. Like if Andrea's getting it, like, you know, and I was deemed the healthy one, you know, like if she's getting it, how the hell, like, how did that happen? Um, so really also kind of rocked, you know, the world of my, not only my family, but my circle of friends, because there's just too many of us getting diagnosed that it's coincidence and it's not genetic because I did have the BRACMA test. So it's not BRACMA. So how do you explain this? You know, um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot. And, um, you know, it's, just, that's, that's quite a moving emotional story. Very. Yeah. Very. Well, thank you for sharing it. I mean, that was really brave of you and thank you. Deborah. Um, I think people will really connect to a lot of that. And, um, especially people that are in those beginning stages trying to figure out what to do next. That's right. Yeah. And, you know, and I, and I, like I've told you before too, you know, if, um, as I know, we'll have a few more of these types of, of conversations going forward. Mm -hmm. Um, and if there's anything I can do to be a support system for folks that are in it, you know, to obviously reach out at any time, um, because I know it can be a real daunting experience and a, a real feeling of isolation. And, and, Quite candidly, I still battle it even today. So there's there's a real benefit for community, and I'm trying to build community because, again, in the spirit of transparency, I don't have community with people who relate and understand. Um, so I just throw that out there too, um, that people can reach out uh, just for anything, really. That's great. We can put your information with this podcast, and and um, you know, I I just heard recently. I think it was. Dr. Bernie Siegel, and he was uh, speaking to Ma Dr. Marilyn Joyce, and um, he was saying, you know, don't try and think of cancer as your enemy, like you're going to war, because that empowers your enemy. Try and think of it as your teacher. And oh, what, what is cancer trying to teach you? Oh, yeah. Um, and then it, it, it kind of makes you, because I'm sure nobody asked you, why, did, why do you think you got cancer? And, and to really think about what what happened at the root and um, mm -hmm. what what needs to be changed in your lifestyle and your beliefs or your relationships or your you know and th and then you begin starting to go down a road of nurturing and um, listening to your heart uh, on that healing journey and I and I keep hearing that over and over you know live in your heart be authentic yes. love yourself. Um, 
and all these things that kind of that mind body spirit connection that needs to happen on every level um and this is why i kind of went on a quest too to figure out how to help people in that way because uh nutrition is extremely important and not taught and and we do need to learn that but that's one piece yeah um, and i think all the pieces need to be in play so i and, agree and you don't yeah. know any of them when you first get diagnosed oh. so here's you know i thought it would be great to go on the journey with you um because you you tell it so well and um i think you're very relatable so people Thank you and, and it and it's really um really an emotional story yeah you, know, you were pregnant and, and everything you know what you but you hit the nail on the head and i don't want to get i don't want to cry but it's uh many a dark days i remember sitting with my bald head and my no eyebrows and no eyelashes looking out the window of my living room thinking same thing like i know that this is a blessing i may not see it yet but the blessing is coming the bless and the mess yeah and it will forever change you and it, it will it will forever change you and it is it is in a positive way so i can't wait to share that with you and, and others to say you know how how has it changed me because i definitely feel like i have changed uh immensely for the better you feel like you you've lost yourself and you're still floundering to figure out who am i now mm -hmm. but i guarantee you it's a whole hell of a lot better than what it was before right um so yeah i i look forward to, to talking with you guys more about it because it's uh it's it's pretty um it's a beautiful thing i don't even know how to put it into words it's just beyond comprehension in a lot of ways yeah and i think if you're a caregiver also or if you're kind of um related to somebody that has cancer and you're experiencing it you're thinking about prevention you know the, these are all the things that people need to think about um because you're going to have to think about it anyway if you get a diagnosis and with and with one in two people now pretty much getting a diagnosis yep. in their lifetime it's just, it's really important um even if you're getting testing done i know you still uh need to these things all need to be in place so you avoid the inevitable um, exactly yeah it, and, and really that's a joyous life right it it's the way it was supposed to be right <laughs> let's be honest like i mean that's the insanity of it all like if if it's this is this is this is what i tell people too this is our generational wake-up call right that's the kind of where wake-up call that. right right we are 30s and 40s getting cancer what does that tell you about our life and all kinds of other things too and all other so sorts of yeah so exactly um i only wish we could get i only hope that this type of message impacts people who have not yet been diagnosed because too many of us are getting diagnosed that it's like you said one and two it's it's a crapshoot people like it doesn't have to be the destiny so you know it's it's a, it matters um, because even for the, for your children you start looking at it like okay so is he gonna get it you know it's like twenties is twenty the new forty like what's what is this what are we doing so yeah I I, look, I really do um, yeah I look forward to to continuing to chat with you well, well we're gonna talk again soon and I appreciate okay candor um, thanks and this is wonderful to spread to everybody and thank you so much for being with us. My pleasure. And I, um, again, always, always an open door if anyone needs help or a word of encouragement. Thank you. We'll post okay. that information. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Bye everyone. Bye.